Let me know if there if there's any uh, lag or anything. Let me know, and I'll just turn my video off. Yeah, sounds good. Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Um, just one second. Yes, you can just turn it, Luca. That way you can control the mouse from where you're seating. We might just be able to take the. Oh, it's fine. Yeah, we probably. Um, so welcome everyone. So for the very last kind of seminar of this uh, academic year, we're very happy to have our very own Max Lapa, um, who has been a, a postdoc here for the past three years, almost three years. Um, during his time here, Matt has worked on uh, geometric aspects of the quantum Hall effect, uh, and more recently on, on topological superconductivity, in particular on uh, going beyond the mean field approximation and deriving rigorous results. Uh, and today he's going to tell us about rigorous results in systems of interacting photons. Um, so Matt, take it away. All right. Thanks, Luca. Thanks for uh, giving me the chance to share these results. So uh, this is something I've been working on for the past year. I actually gave the group meeting last year on some ideas along this direction, but uh, didn't have any concrete results at that time. But so this is something I've been working on. I'm writing it up now. So if anyone has any comments or um, uh, reference suggestions, uh, please let me know. So um, yeah, so this is a short outline of the talk. So I'll um, do a little bit of motivation and this will mostly come from uh, Luttinger's theorem, which is sort of the most famous general result about systems of interacting fermions and um, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the original statement of Luttinger's theorem, and then there's a controversy about uh, whether it will actually hold in any given model that you look at, or you know, whether you to hold or can't you? Um, so I'll use that as motivation, and then I'll try to discuss um, rigorous results that will hold in concrete models that also deal with the momentum space picture of a system of interacting fermions. And then I'll uh, kind of sketch how the proof works and then end with some summary and some ideas for future work. And uh, feel free to interrupt at any time with questions. So, um, so the motivation for this, it's, you know, everyone kind of knows it's hard to obtain reliable information on interacting fermion systems. Here I mean uh, systems where you take a free fermion system with a Fermi surface and then you add interactions on top of that. You want to know what happens. Um, so exact solutions are rare above one dimension. Um, it's difficult to judge the accuracy of approximate methods and, um, you know, you can sometimes tell that by how people talk in private about their uh, colleagues' approximate methods. So there's no general consensus about what approximate methods are reliable. Um, and then uh, general arguments are valuable, but it's useful also to have results that are guaranteed to hold in concrete models. And this is sort of the angle that I'm coming at in this work. So you should think of the whole talk as, uh, you know, based on this idea of, I want to try to find some results that you can guarantee will hold in concrete models. Um, so Luttinger's theorem is sort of the best known result along these lines. And it deals with the volume that's enclosed by the Fermi surface in an interacting system. And uh, one thing uh, you should notice there is you need to define what you mean by the Fermi surface in an interacting system. So in the context of these original works by Luttinger and Luttinger and Ward, um, they were working within uh, perturbation theory. And in that case, you could define the Fermi surface in an interacting system through a, a pole in a certain uh, propagator. But uh, if you're trying to work outside of that perturbation theory context, it's hard to come up with a definition. Um, so most of the derivations of this theorem rely on different assumptions. And I'll tell you what some of those are. And in general, I think you just shouldn't expect this theorem to hold in some generic model that someone would give you of interacting fermions. Um, oh, and by the way, I just, I didn't put journal uh, names for references, but if anyone wants to know what references I'm talking about, you can just email me or ask me later. Is the ward the same as the word of ward identities? I believe so. Uh, yeah, as far as I know, he is. So 
in those original papers by Luttinger, so there's this earlier paper by Luttinger and Ward where they um, put together this general uh, perturbation theory framework for interacting fermions at finite temperature. And then in the second paper by Luttinger, what he does is he, he starts with that and then takes a zero temperature limit. And what he does is he studies the momentum occupation numbers. So you take the yeah. occupation number of the state at momentum K and spin sigma, you take the expectation value in the ground state. And uh, he looked at this in a free fermion system where you perturb it by two body interactions. And within the framework of perturbation theory, he could show that uh, one, that this function is discontinuous as a function of K. So it has a discontinuity at a certain surface in momentum space. And then two, that the volume enclosed by that surface is equal to the volume enclosed by the Fermi surface of the unperturbed system that would be just described by the free Hamiltonian. And so the picture that you get from this looks like what I've drawn at the bottom here. So you have uh, the occupation numbers as a function of, in this case, I let's say you have spherical symmetry, so you can plot everything as a function of the magnitude of K. And what you see here is, um, KF would be the uh, unperturbed Fermi surface location. And this dotted line that's at one would be the case for the free Hamiltonian. So in the free Hamiltonian, N is one if you're below the Fermi surface and zero above. But what he shows is that in the interacting system, you would get some picture like this where N is uh, close to one below the Fermi surface, then it has some sharp discontinuity, and then it's close to zero above. And uh, there's a, a conservation of particle number here. So the area under this red curve is equal to the original total particle number, but the discontinuity is located at the uh, location of the unperturbed Fermi surface. Um, more generally, if you don't have spherical symmetry, then the discontinuity is at some surface and that surface's volume is supposed to be the same as the volume closed by the Fermi surface in the unperturbed system, but the shape could change. And uh, so this is the original uh, statement in Luttinger's work. And then the modern statements usually don't discuss one at all. And they instead discuss two, uh, this point number two in uh, different contexts where they're able to sort of, they have some other approach that lets them define this surface in a different way, and they don't have to worry about studying the momentum occupation number. Uh, is this in any dimension? Uh, in the perturbation theory context, you don't see a dimension dependence come in. So that's sort of one indication that something is suspicious. Do the results depend on the sign of lambda? That is whether the interactions are repulsive or attractive? Not in the perturbative derivation. So that is another sign that the perturbative derivation is suspicious. So yeah, indeed, one example where this theorem definitely doesn't hold is uh, attractive interactions that induce superconductivity. In that case, uh, you can calculate N and see that it goes smoothly through uh, the Fermi surface. It actually looks like a Fermi Dirac distribution, but instead of KB times T, you have the gap of the uh, that's you know opened up in the superconductor. Right. So that's yeah one example where this definitely doesn't hold and where perturbation theory definitely doesn't converge. So and actually uh, yeah so I'm I'm about to come to this but Luttinger in his original paper said I only expect this to hold in situations where perturbation theory is valid. Um, but if it uh, doesn't hold for if it doesn't hold for negative lambda then it can't have a finite radius of convergence about lambda equals zero. Right, yeah, exactly. And uh, so that's it's sort of a simple observation, and yet uh, you'll find hundreds of pages in the literature of people discussing when they do think or don't think that certain parts of Luttinger's derivation will hold. And uh, I won't be able to untangle that today, but my impression is that it's as simple as the statement that if you have some function and you also have an asymptotic series for that function about some value of the argument, just because you can prove something holds to all orders in the asymptotic series doesn't mean that it holds for the function. I think it's as simple as that, but um, if you want to, you can find very long discussions of when people think this 
really won't hold. Um, Maybe it's not completely fair to say it doesn't hold when you have a superconductor, because then I would say, oh, there's just no Fermi surface. Okay. The, well, the statement assumes there's mm -hmm. a Fermi surface, right? Well, the statement first shows that there's a discontinuity at some surface, and then... Right, right, right. Yeah. No, no, but, I, but just the statements that uh, if you have a Fermi surface, then its volume is the density. That statement obviously doesn't make sense if there's no oh, Fermi surface. Yeah, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, that also though comes back a little bit to this issue of how you define Fermi surface right. interacting system. Yeah. Um, but uh, at least my impression is that the situation is as simple as that. It's just the derivation completely relies on the structure of perturbation theory. So if perturbation theory doesn't converge, you just can't expect it to hold. Um, so there are recent works that don't use a perturbation theory approach, but they make other assumptions. For example, they assume that uh, in this work by Oshikawa, that at low energies, the system is a Fermi liquid. And then the only question is uh, determining which uh, momentum states are occupied in that or not. And you can use, he used a momentum balance type argument to figure out what states would be occupied. But again, this depends on some very strong assumption about the system. And uh, what I would say about all these results is that if someone gives you a particular concrete model, say a Hubbard model, and they tell you the value of the interaction and uh, compare it to the typical kinetic energy, and then they also tell you the total particle number, there's no easy way to tell if uh, some version of Luttinger's theorem will actually hold for that model. So that's sort of uh, where I, I'm uh, getting motivation for this project is, uh, trying to figure out what's, if some result like this would hold in concrete models. So um, let me talk a little bit about uh, rigorous status of this kind of result. So it turns out that actually, if you look at some 2D models that break inversion symmetry, so, e, so this E would be the uh, energy of the single particle uh, part of the Hamiltonian in momentum space, if you, break inversion symmetry, this eliminates pairing instabilities, zero momentum pairing instabilities, because now the energy at plus and minus K are not the same. And in that case, although with great difficulty, you actually can prove a result like Luttinger's original one, where you prove that there really is a continuity at the non-interacting Fermi surface. Um, but uh, of course, most models of interest do have inversion symmetry, so this is not a very natural assumption. Um, the other type of rigorous result that's out there is that in one dimension, um, if you take a free fermion system that has a uh, Fermi wave vector Kf, and you add certain types of interactions, then you can prove that the system will still have a gapless excitation at momentum 2Kf. So that 2Kf is like the particle hole excitation where you take a particle from right near minus KF and you bring it up above KF. So this statement is that something like that excitation survives in these 1D systems. Um, and then there's reported violations of the original form of Luttinger's theorem in several different kinds of models. Um, so I think that it's fairly clear that you just shouldn't expect this result to hold uh, generically. Um, what else did I want to say about this? Matt, is there a, ever a situation where you do have a Fermi surface in the IR and it doesn't hold? Oh, where you, it just has the wrong volume or something like that? Right. Yeah. Uh, that, I'm not sure. I don't think people looked at that case. Um, well, let's see. I guess it's possible that some of these results could be interpreted that way where they, they basically show that um, there's a way of phrasing Luttinger's original result where it says that the particle number is equal to the integral of the, um, you just integrate over all uh, the region of momentum space where the um, Green's function has a, a certain sign, like say positive. Because once you hit a pole, so, for free fermion systems, the Fermi surface is, corresponds to a pole in the Green's function, so it will change sign there. And so there's a way of phrasing Luttinger's theorem where it looks like you equate the particle density with the integral 
over just the region of momentum space where that uh, Green's function is positive, let's say. And uh, so you can interpret uh, some of these results probably as saying that the counting that you get from the, the particle density does not equal the count that you get from trying to do that. So probably that may correspond to something like you're saying, but I'm not sure if they find that it gets bigger or smaller. Does that include like Levenger surfaces as well? Do, do these systems have manifolds of zeros of the Green's function as well? Because that is also something that changes sign the Green's function, right? Yeah, in these examples, this failure is all due to uh, zeros. I see. Yeah. And I think, for example, in these works by Philip Phillips, I think their point is just that you end up counting up all these zeros, but the zeros give you something spurious that's not contributing to the total particle density. Right. Aren't there some examples that involve fractionalized Fermi, I don't know, FL star phases or something, counter examples of that kind, or am I misremembering? Yeah, in that case, so there's a work by uh, Paramakanti and Vishwanath where they, they redid this uh, Oshikawa argument, but they assumed also that in addition to some gapless uh, free firm, well, they assume that what you have at low energies is a Fermi liquid plus some gap system that has some excitation that uh, corresponds to, I guess, two pi flux. Um, and there they find that the, the gap sector can soak up part of this counting. So you again, don't find the equality between the particle number and the volume of the Fermi surface because you have this other sector that can balance the equation. So that's true that there is a result like that, but uh, I don't know of uh, concrete models where it's been observed. And would you count uh, neutral Fermi surfaces as counterexamples too, or are these? A neutral Fermi surface. Okay. So you mean like this emergent yeah. fermions with, that don't yeah. carry U1 charge? Right. I mean, I guess in that case, there's no reason for their Fermi surface to equate with, uh, or, or to, if you look at the that enclosed by that, you wouldn't think there's any reason that it has to equal the true particle number. Um, yeah, I don't know if you would ha have a reason to believe that some type of result should hold in that case. Okay, uh, let's see. So, okay, so um, that's sort of the end of the review. So what I want to do here is sort of Think about Luttinger's theorem as a kind of stability result that says uh, if, so let's uh, sort of lower our bar of what we're trying to show about the system, first of all. And let's just think of this as a type of stability result that says um, if this result is true, then the momentum space picture of the interacting system is very close to that of the free system. And uh, this sort of perspective uh, connects nicely with this normalization group approach to stability of free fermion systems that was sort of pioneered by Polchinski and Shankar, where they look at uh, an RG transformation that would have as a fixed point a free fermion system with a Fermi surface. And then they study relevance or irrelevance of perturbations around that surface. And in that case, by the way, you do find that uh, you always have uh, relevance or marginal relevance, at least of uh, attractive interactions that lead to pairing. So the system is always, the Fermi surface is always unstable to that. Um, and so what I wanna do is just try to prove a stability result of this kind of flavor of showing that the momentum space picture is close to that of the free system and uh, show it in some concrete models. and. What I'll do is uh, follow Luttinger's original work and study the momentum occupation numbers. And uh, I'll show actually some results at the ground state, but uh, in the ground state, but mainly I want to show some finite temperature results. And the reason for doing that is uh, the following. So uh, at zero temperature, there's all kinds of instabilities that you might expect. So especially in Hubbard type models, uh, superconductivity, antiferromagnetism. There's something called the cone luttinger instability, which is uh, supposed to, it says that uh, even if you have short range repulsive interactions, as you go to lower energies, 
you will eventually induce some type of attractive pairing interaction at some angular momentum. And that at very low temperature, you will just end up with some type of pairing instability. Um, so the idea that I'm sort of following here is that if the system is close to free, it, it's got to be above the transition temperature for these instabilities. And uh, this idea where I kind of got the idea for this approach is in the mathematical physics literature, people uh, really emphasize this idea and decided to study instead um, uh, perturbations of free fermion models at finite temperature trying to work above the transition temperature for any low temperature instabilities and then trying to um, make their bounds as precise as possible so they could try to really get close to where that uh, transition might actually happen. So this led to actually really strong results uh, for many 2D interacting fermion models where people could show. Uh, so they looked at all the uh, imaginary time Green's functions and they were able to show that they're actually holomorphic in the coupling constant at finite temperature in some finite region of the complex plane where the complexified interaction parameter lives. And uh, th there's actually a PRL by Desertori and Rivasso that nicely summarizes their program, but their bounds are actually so uh, tight that if you look at the, um, so they have some expression for the radius of convergence of these uh, expansions. And if you look at the relationship between the interaction strength and the temperature at the boundary of this region where they can prove convergence, it looks exactly like the relation between the interaction and the critical temperature in BCS theory. So their uh, results are sort of the best possible that you could get. But anyway, the main physical idea there is you go above the temperature where these instabilities could occur, and there you might be able to show that the system is behaving similarly to a free fermion system. Um, okay, so uh, let's see, how is the time doing so far? Okay, not too bad. All right, so then the rest of the talk, I'll just present the results and sketch the proof a little bit. So the main type of model I'll be looking at is the Hubbard model. And uh, so let's just uh, set the notation here. So, um, so we have fermions of uh, spin one half. So sigma labels the spin and can be up and down. Uh, we have creation and annihilation operators C, X, sigma that obey all the usual relations. Uh, X here is a point on a brevet lattice uh, that I call lambda. And um, absolute value of lambda is the number of sites in lattice. And then, as usual, you define number operators for each site and spin. And uh, you can also define a Fourier transform creation and annihilation operators in momentum space. And the Hubbard model, what you have here is you have the free fermion term that's diagonal in momentum space. And here you have some chemical potential and some. I'm allowing a general single particle energy dispersion, so it doesn't have to be just nearest neighbor hopping. Um, and then uh, the interaction, of course, is diagonal in real space. And what it is is you have some interaction strength U that would be positive for repulsive interactions, negative for attractive. And then you just sum over all the sites. And on each site, you take the number of spin up fermions times the number of spin down. And uh, so this is, uh, it's, you know, very well known that the reason this model is hard is because one term is diagonal in momentum space and one is diagonal in position space. And what we'll want to do is try to understand the effect of this interaction term on the uh, momentum occupation numbers, which would be uh, in the finite temperature case described by a Fermi Dirac distribution. So, um, right. So this is what we'll calculate. Um, so expectation value of n k sigma, and we'll work in the grand canonical ensemble. So in that case, I just mean uh, we're tracing this trace is taken over the entire Fox space. So over all different particle number sectors, and I absorb the chemical potential into H, so it doesn't appear here. And when the interaction is zero, we know these are given by a Fermi Dirac distribution. 
And the goal will be to try to get a bound on the difference between the momentum occupation numbers, the true ones, and then the Fermi Dirac distribution. And so this is the result, sort of very simple to state. Um, let's see. So what we have here, so I'll just kind of walk through it. So this holds for any value of K and at any finite temperature. And so in the middle, we have the uh, difference of um, the true momentum occupation numbers and the um, Fermi Dirac distribution. And then what's on either side is sort of, a, it's a little strange looking. So first you have this uh, coefficient, which is just the interaction strength divided by KBT. So it's sort of a natural dimensionless parameter. And then uh, you might think about there's a weaker result than this that just says that the absolute value of this difference is less than delta. But what this is taking care of is the fact that um, N can never get above one and it can never get below zero. So what this extra multiplicative factors of the Fermi Dirac distribution are doing is sort of taking care of that. So it's keeping you always within the bounds of uh, one and zero. And maybe I can kind of just try to draw what this looks like. So, um, so if you look at the original Fermi Dirac distribution, what this is saying is there's sort of a, um, a sliding window that ends a little bit above. On the top, it gets very close to the Fermi Dirac distribution at low energies. And at high energies, this window ends a little bit above at some distance uh, delta. And then you have a similar picture below. So below, you also have this uh, window like that. And this distance is delta again. And all along here, the width of the window is always equal to delta. And uh, what's happening is so this whole thing is sitting between uh, zero and, and one. And uh, these multiplicative factors here are just keeping you between zero and one. And so what this is saying is you're always stuck within this window. And um, the interesting thing about this is that, um, so it's clear that this uh, occupation number will look like Fermi Dirac distribution at very high temperatures when uh, U is much smaller than KBT. But the interesting thing is that there's an intermediate temperature regime where if U is much smaller than KBT, but that's much smaller than the Fermi energy, which is just the uh, difference between the uh, energy at zero momentum and the chemical potential. Then what will happen is you will be very close to a low temperature Fermi Dirac distribution. So it's sort of, uh, you have this regime where this system is guaranteed, at least in terms of this momentum occupation number to look like a low temperature free fermion system. And um, That's, I, I missed how many dimensions you were in. This is for any dimensions? Or? This is for any dimension. So it's a result independent of dimension. So I, yeah, so I was going to say that it, it would be tempting to call this like a um, Fermi liquid type regime, but it, that can't be right because this result is independent of dimension. So it's probably weaker than saying that it's a Fermi liquid. Um, but it does say that at least as far as these momentum occupation numbers are concerned, the system will be very close to looking like the free fermion system. So that's the main uh, result. So, uh, so I understand this is you're at a temperature high enough, the interactions stop mattering, basically. Yeah, that's right. And so one thing about that is if you just go to very high temperatures, this curve will uh, sort of um, it's going to flatten out to one half because basically every state is equally likely at very high temperatures. So that part is not too surprising, but the interesting part is that you have this intermediate temperature regime where this Fermi Dirac distribution can have a nice sharp slope still in the middle, looking like the low temperature free fermion system. And uh, you can have the interaction turned on still. So this the finite temperature kind of buys you here because in a minute I'll show you a, a zero temperature result that is not nearly as strong and it's somehow it's because you don't have this temperature to smooth things out. Um, so that that's the main result. Um, let's see. 
Um, okay, so let me show the, the zero temperature result, which is a little bit more complicated looking. Uh, so if you work in the ground state, in the grand canonical ensemble, that just means that you find the lowest energy state among all the different particle number sectors. So that state, once you've found it, in particular, it has a definite particle number for each spin uh, because the Hubbard model conserves particle number for each spin separately. So you can define the uh, particle numbers in the ground state and the filling fractions. And then in that case, so here's what you will get by a slightly more refined analysis. So before we could compare U to the temperature, but now there's no temperature to compare to. So instead, what you find is that you have a K-dependent bound where um, there's some surface in momentum space that's not the uh, original surface where EK minus mu equals zero, but it's now been shifted by the interaction a bit. Actually, I was showing this result to Michael and he pointed out that this is like a mean field correction to the chemical potential that you would get if you treat the Hubbard model in mean field theory. But uh, so there's a result that, so there's a surface defined by this equation. And if you're above the surface, then you get an upper bound on NK. And if you're below the surface, you get a lower bound or equivalently an upper bound on one minus NK. So what it says is that uh, NK will approach its non-interacting value of zero or one as you move away from this surface. But you can see that the bound is not strong enough to let you go right up to this surface. Eventually you will get to somewhere where the uh, denominator gets smaller than the numerator and then this bound is not useful anymore. So um, I'm not sure if you can do this, at least not for any sign of the interaction. It could be that with repulsive interactions and a more refined analysis, you can get a better bound than this. But this was the best one that I was able to get with the kind of techniques that I had. Um, one slightly interesting thing about this is that at half filling, you'll get an exact cancellation between uh, this uh, shift and the chemical potential that's required for half filling so that the um, surface that's determined by this equation will coincide with the non-interacting Fermi surface of the system without the interactions there. So that's sort of like a Luttinger theorem type result where the surface that's involved is the same one that you have without the interactions, but of course it's not nearly as strong. Um, but that was the closest thing I could get to it a result of that type that lets you uh, talk about the shape of the Fermi surface. Um, okay, so that is the uh, main results. I want to show now a generalization of the results where it turns out that you don't really need to uh, have translation and variance in the perturbation. And in fact, it's interesting to ask, what if you, you know, in just some normal uh, piece of material, what happens if you, uh, just have some disorder there, you know, because we always want to, you know, describe materials in terms of a nice uh, basis in momentum space and thinking about it as free fermions. Um, but of course, there's always a little bit dis of disorder and you can always just ask what happens to the momentum occupation numbers just in the presence of a, a single particle potential that's non-uniform, not even necessarily worrying about adding interactions yet. So you can ask the same question in this case where you, uh, want to know, you know, how does uh, NK deviate from a Fermi Dirac distribution with the average of these um, single particle potentials? And so this would be like a stability result to interactions and disorder. And it turns out that the same techniques allow you to treat this case. And, um, and by the way, uh, I'm not doing any disorder averaging here. So I'm just have some fixed given set of coefficients mu and u, and uh, I treat them as fixed. They would be differ from, you know, sample to sample, say, and um, you just are stuck with them and you want to see how much they um, perturb the free fermion picture, which is the diagonal and momentum space. And uh, so in this case, you can repeat the same uh, type of derivation. And it turns out you'll get the same bound as before, where now this FK is the Fermi Dirac distribution with the average chemical potential, mu bar. And then you have 
delta is again the uh, beta times some measures of the interaction strength and the disorder strength. But in this case, what you have now is uh, this S is the standard deviation of the uh, single particle potential. So you just sum up uh, all the square deviations of mu from the average. And then for the interaction here, it's just the root mean square of the uh, interaction strength. So it's almost the same result. Um, so I think this is a nice result because even if you, uh, let's say you turned off the interactions, you could always say that, well, then you have a, a quadratic Hamiltonian and it's diagonal in some basis. And in that basis, the moment, the uh, occupation numbers are given exactly by a Fermi Dirac distribution. But um, that basis really has no physical meaning because it will differ from you know sample to sample when these mu's could be different. So it's nice to have some uh, bound on um, how much the disorder affects the uh, occupation numbers in the original translation invariant basis. So it turns out you can handle that as well uh, by these techniques. So uh, those are all the results. And now I'm just going to kind of sketch the proof of this to show a little bit how it works. Um, are there any questions about the results before I move on? Okay. All right, so this is the kind of outline of the proofs. There's sort of two main steps, really. Um, the first step is a, a local version of the variational principle. And this will allow you to isolate the um, uh, occupation number at a single momentum value. And then the second step, which is, I think, the really non-trivial step, is a certain bound on a term involving the interaction. And to prove this bound, we'll need to use the Fermi statistics of the pulse. And I think that is a very important thing, because even in this case of uh, free fermions with a disordered potential, there would be no analogous result for bosons, because the both statistics don't have the right type of bound. So I think that is a very important part of this proof. And it's maybe not too surprising that the stability would depend on the statistics of the particles. And then there's some algebra to finish the proof. Um, convexity always comes in when you're working at finite temperature with different types of expressions. So the first step is to use uh, a local version of the variational principle. So at, uh, at zero temperature, there's sort of pretty well-known local version of the variational principle where if you, you take in the ground, the true ground state, you take the expectation value of some operator O dagger times the commutator of H with O. And in the ground state, this will always be positive. And the way you see this is you just uh, kind of expand this out. And it, what it looks like is that you're taking a trial state that is O times the true ground state. And then by the variational principle, that trial state always has a higher energy than the true ground state. And so that's where this first line comes from. And you see this form of the variational principle used a lot in, um, there's an algebraic formalism for saying lattice models directly in the infinite volume limit. And there to avoid working with extensive quantities that would diverge, you always take uh, commutators of the Hamiltonian with local operators. And then H commutator with O would be local. And then you would avoid any type of uh, you know, diverging expressions associated with the infinite volume. So that's where you see this a lot. And then there's, I think, a much less known version of this at finite temperature. I learned it from a paper by Sewell, where he was actually working on that algebraic formalism for infinite volume systems, but at finite temperature. And so what this is here, so the left-hand side is like, uh, mostly like what we have above. Um, you see there's a beta here, which if you bring it to the other side, it becomes KBT. And if you send the temperature to zero, the right-hand side will become zero and you'll recover the original zero temperature result. But the non-trivial thing about this is there's a function phi here that it's a function of two real variables and it's U log U minus U log V. And this is of course coming from some type of relative entropy that's involved in uh, 
the Gibbs variational principle. So at finite temperature, the variational principle is for the free energy that involves not only the expectation value of the Hamiltonian, but also the entropy. So that's where this thing is coming from. And uh, what's inside here is thermal expectation of O dagger O, and then thermal expectation of O times O dagger. So the first step of the proof is to use these bounds, um, but instead of taking O to be local in real space, which is what people would normally do with this, we'll take it to be local in momentum space. So we just do it once with C K sigma, and then once with C dagger K sigma. And those two choices are actually gonna to lead to the upper and lower bounds in those inequalities that I showed you. So if you do this and you, um, separate the Hamiltonian into two terms with the free part and the interaction, then the commutator with the free part will isolate the number operator for that uh, momentum. So that's sort of the key idea of this step is you're using the, these commutators to isolate the um, uh, occupation numbers for one momentum. But then uh, you also will end up having the commutator of U with uh, C and you'll need a bound on an expression like this. Um, and so that's the, the second step of the proof is trying to bound something like that. So I'll show you, uh, there's a kind of uh, simple looking bound on this quantity. And then I'll show you a little bit later how you could derive something like this. But the bound is that if you take any normalized state psi and you look at an expectation value of this form then it's very simply bounded from above by the absolute value of the interaction. So it's a very simple looking bound. And then if this is true for any normalized state, it turns out you'll get the same bound for the uh, thermal expectation value just by using the triangle inequality. Um, so uh, the proof actually turns out uses the Fermi statistics in a non-trivial way, which makes it not valid in a bosonic model with the same type of interactions. And uh, the proof that I found also actually uses the bilinear structure of the Hubbard model, that it has an interaction of uh, the number operator for spin up times the number operator for spin down. And I think that's probably a, uh, a limitation that's not physical. So there's probably a better version of this proof that doesn't use that, but so far I haven't been able to find it. So, um, yeah, in the remaining time, I just want to sketch this proof a little bit, but not actually for the Hubbard interaction, but just for the disordered potential, which although it's free fermions, it still shows a bunch of the non-trivial uh, aspects that enter into this proof. So that's what I'll do now. So um, this part may get into the weeds a little bit, but I think it's interesting to show how it works. Um, so Matt, just a, just a quick question about step one. So you, you had this uh, yeah. bound, this finite temperature mm -hmm. bound, and you said it it, it uh, physically it was coming from some kind of entropy business. Can you say a little more about this? Is this related to some kind of monotonicity of entropies or something? So this um, this one actually is. Uh, let's see, where's the here? Well. What goes a, into showing it? So, yeah, yeah. So what goes into showing this is actually uh, uh, all of these finite temperature bounds are always using convexity and then Jensen's inequality for convex functions. Um, it's the same. You would use the same thing to prove monotonicity of relative entropy. The key step there is also Jensen's inequality for convex functions. Um, it's used here in basically the same way. Um, yeah, let's see, what are a couple interesting things here? So the Gibbs variational principle is, is the global version where it just says that the true, it says if you have some density matrix gamma that's not the thermal one, then the true free energy is always uh, less than or equal to the, um, let's see, the trace of H against this uh, other density matrix gamma and then minus temperature times uh, trace of gamma log gamma. So it's, you know, you try to compute the free energy with this gamma and it's always gonna be larger than what you would get using the true thermal density matrix. And then this uh, 
inequality is sort of a local version of that, but actually it turns out is the relationship between this inequality and the global version is not nearly as straightforward as the case with the uh, zero temperature case. Um, but the way that I've written here, the proof is fairly straightforward just using the convexity of this phi function. Um, one more kind of non-trivial thing here that got me stuck for a little while is this thing that's sitting in here. Um, there's a bunch of thermodynamic inequalities like bogo lubovs inequality that use a double commutator that is, um, you know, I take H commutator with O and then I take the commutator of that with O dagger. That's actually not what's sitting in here because of this minus sign. Uh, this is actually um, closer to, uh, you could call it uh, like a Lindbladian where what's sitting in there is actually this guy. Um, think if I wrote that correctly. Uh, or maybe the, the one half is I pulled it out, but um, yeah, so there's something non-trivial here about what exactly is sitting inside this expectation value. And it's actually this type of operator that I've shown down here, which it looks like a Lindblad operator. If anyone has looked at, you know, dynamics of density matrices under different types of perturbations, it's not this double commutator type thing that you see in like a bogo Lyubov inequality. Um, and then this, when you expand this out using some uh, basis of eigenstates for H, you will naturally find this function phi, and then you can use convexity properties of it to get to this inequality. So that's what's going on there. Okay, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right, so let me just sketch this proof because I want to just kind of highlight some things where you see that you really need to use Fermi statistics to prove this, even in the um, free Fermian case. Um, so let's look at this uh, case where you have the single particle potential that's disordered. So I um, let me go back to the laser pointer. So I separated H into the um, case with uh, the part with the dispersion and the average chemical potential. And then the, I'll put in V, the average minus the, um, just the true disordered potential. And then if you write out this commutator type of um, expression that you need to bound, what you'll find is it looks like this. So you have one factor of the system size in the denominator, but then you actually have a sum over two things. So you have a sum over X and Q and then the sum end has uh, the interact uh, the um, disorder strength. It has some uh, momentum type factor, and then it has this expectation value of CK dagger CQ, which is all involves momentum space fermions. And if you try to do a naive bound on this with the triangle inequality, what you'll find is that okay, you have one factor of volume in the denominator, but you have two sums over ordered lambda terms each, and the sum n naive, naively is order one. And this would lead you to a bound on this that's of order lambda. And uh, that bound will not be useful for deriving those inequalities that I showed you. So you want to get a bound on this that's of order one. And for that, you need to use the Fermi statistics. That's what I'll show you now. So let's start by uh, making some definitions. So um, let's take the sum over x and uh, of the disorder strength. So we'll just essentially take the Fourier transform of the deviations of mu from their average. And then we'll just call this expectation value MKQ. And so rewritten in terms of that, we have uh, looks like a sum over lambda and a sum over Q of um, two expressions. You could try to rewrite this as matrix multiplication if you want. And then we can use Cauchy-Schwartz and uh, get some bound like this. And this uh, sum over Q here by uh, Poincaré's theorem, this will just give you the system size squared times the standard deviation of the um, disorder strengths. So this is 
this lambda squared is under the square root, so that will cancel nicely with the um, factor of lambda in the denominator out here. So all of that is of order one, but then the question is, what is going on with this uh, sum that involves um, this matrix M, K of Q? And it turns out that by Fermi statistics, you can show that this is actually less than one, and that will allow you to get the bound of uh, order one on this quantity. And the way it works is, um, so if you consider a uh, matrix M whose matrix elements are given by this expression, um, it turns out that all the eigenvalues of that matrix are between zero and one by the Fermi statistics. But if, and this is actually proved in uh, this old reviews of modern physics by C. N. Yang, but it's actually not, this bound is not true for bosons. So if you replace these Cs with bosonic creation and annihilation operators, um, the upper bound on the eigenvalues is just the trace of the matrix, which is uh, equal to the total particle number in that state, and which would be in general of order the system size. So um, let's see, um, what did I want to say about this? So let's see, and how do you see that? Um, well, the way of seeing it is just to, um, uh, let's see, how much time do I have left? Maybe we could discuss that if anyone is curious. We could discuss that in the extra time, but uh, you need the Fermi statistics to show this bound. And if you don't have it, you would not be able to get that result on the interactions. And it's kind of interesting because you could think about if you have a bosonic system that's free where it's translation invariant and in the ground state, all the particles condense into the zero momentum state. We could try to look at the stability of the, uh, of that system to just its ordered potential. And you might think you could use the same result to show that you still have a macroscopic occupation of the zero momentum state, but actually I can't, not by this method, because the bosonic statistics don't allow for that nice bound. Um, but uh, yeah, again, it's not too surprising that the statistics play an important role. So, um, Okay, so let me just wrap up and then happy to answer any questions. So what I showed is that you could actually get rigorous constraints on the momentum occupation numbers in concrete models of interacting fermions um, in a low temperature regime. And uh, an interesting question, there's a couple for the future work. Um, I'd like to figure out how to get these bounds for more general interactions, like just say a translation invariant two-body interaction where fermions at a distance r interact with some potential v of r. And, you know, maybe this v of r has to satisfy some summability condition. Maybe v of r or v of r squared has to be finite if you sum over all separations. So this would be like a kind of constraint that it's sort of a short-ranged interaction. Um, and then I think there may also be a way to look at bounds on some time-dependent quantities like Green's functions. But I'm not exactly sure. But I think those would be two pretty interesting uh, directions to look at for these techniques. So, all right. So that's the end of the talk. I'm happy to answer questions and hang around for a bit. Questions? Is your bound sharp? Uh, it's sharp in the sense that when the interaction goes to zero, it um, reduces to the correct free fermion result. Is that what you mean? Well, I meant uh, more um, does there exist a Hubbard model at finite coupling that saturates the bound? Oh, I have, I don't know. Yeah, I'm not sure. So tight. Um, sure. Yeah. Tight. Whatever. Whatever word you want to use. <laughs> yeah. No, that's a good question. I, yeah. I mean, that could be studied numerically, right? You could, you could actually compute the answer for, uh, for some finite lattice. Yeah, that would be interesting. I I don't know uh, what system size people can do for that type of calculation. There may be some trick to calculate occupation numbers where you don't need to do exact diagonalization. That'd be interesting. 
what's your bound on ends of k um, as um, k goes to infinity? Is there asymptot asymptotically it has to go down at least as fast as one over epsilon? Yeah, well, in this case, uh, right. So I did this all for lattice models, but um, uh, the bound at infinity is actually not zero. It's uh, delta. Um, let's see. It would be this delta. So the um, let's see if it's safe that drawing I made. Oh yeah. But at least uh, for the lattice model, there is no k it goes to infinity, just the edge of the Bruin zone. But in the lattice case, you see this uh, dotted line. That's the upper bound. It ends at a distance delta above zero. So it asymptotes to delta instead of um, zero. Uh, you had a, a, a slide with mean field at um correction to the energy. It says something like epsilon k minus mu plus u time rho. Uh, can you show that? Oh, yeah, here. Like again? This was in the ground state case. Yeah. And so um, does this inequality say that n sub k should go to zero faster than, cannot go to zero slower than one over epsilon? The first, first. Uh, yeah, that is true. Yeah, in this case. Yeah. Is it inequality? Is it fact no or it's new? That I don't know. I couldn't find any explicit bounds on NK. You can de definitely calculate it within different approximations, but yeah, so this would tell you that it has to go to zero, like one over the dispersion. Um, um, yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I haven't seen anything like it. In three dimension, in um, it would be trivial because you cannot have a tail that is one over q square, one over k mm -hmm. square. Uh, it would be infinite number of particles. But if k, epsilon of k is like k to the fourth, or if you are in lower dimension, this seems to be uh, non-trivial. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks. Yeah. yeah sure. uh, are there analogs of these results in continuum field theories? Uh, let's see. Well, I don't know of any. Um, I didn't really think about trying, but um, let's what see. What would be the statement? What would be the right translation? Probably. Um, well, the. Um, the sort of part where I'm, you have to be careful is I think if you were in a finite volume, then you would have discrete wave vectors and you could use this, again, use this matrix of, uh, uh, you know, standard fermion creation annihilation operators at some, you know, discrete wave vectors. But if you had to work with some field operator in momentum space, that's a function of continuous values of K, I'm not sure what would happen to this result on the um, that eigenvalue bound that I needed to use. So uh, in field theory and in infinite volume, I'm not really sure what would happen. A, a sort of related question is the, that uh, Gibbs um, bound that you were using that 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 Gibbs. Uh, function u log u minus mm -hmm. v log v. Does that have any continuum analog? This Gibbs variational principle, the local version of it? The local version, uh, it probably does, but I've never seen it. I mean, the, the only time I've ever seen this is in this one paper by Sewell. But um, I would guess as long as you know the traces involved are well behaved, then you would have this inequality you know like if if everything in here is trace class then the derivation yeah. should go through um i've never seen it used actually this is the only paper i've ever seen it in but um i would imagine it would hold also 
interesting. Is there an intuition in this thing that you gamma is some kind of small perturbation around the thermal state, maybe generated by this operator, and that then you compare that density matrix to the thermal density matrix? Yeah, that's the intuition. I actually am not sure how to carry out that um, uh, derivation from sort of that perspective, but that, that is the sort of idea. Like in this ground state case, what you would want to do is just um, like in the ground state, it's really straightforward. You just, um, you say, okay, if psi is the true ground state, I'm going to use O times psi as a trial state. It's not normalized, but that's okay. Um, and in that case, I know that if I, you know, take O dagger, you know, if I do this thing, it's got to be greater than or equal to the ground state energy times the, uh, norm of the trial state, which looks like this. And if you rearrange this, you'll find that it is uh, this same inequality that I wrote here. But um, yeah, there's probably a derivation along those lines of this inequality, but I, I don't know it. Not exactly sure how you would uh, write the perturbed uh, density matrix to do that. But anyway, I think this inequality is probably pretty interesting to use. I, I've uh, hadn't seen it before, and uh, it was the only thing that I found that could, for example, even just in the free case, it gives you that you have the upper and lower bound by the Fermi Dirac distribution. Um, I tried some other well known thermodynamic inequalities, and they are not nearly that sharp. So. So in, in this approach, the, um, you, you're always asking about a Fermi surface built out of the fermions that you had access to microscopically, right? Yeah. So you wouldn't be able to address, for example, like a composite Fermi liquid Fermi surface? No, not with this method. Yeah, this is sort of only has access to uh, the microscopic fermions. Unless you had some way of rewriting the Hamiltonian in terms of the other the emergent fermions. And that sort of comes from the, um, the way this proof works is, uh, you know, this variational principle allows you to extract the momentum that you're interested in. And then the price you have to pay for that extracted some nasty commutator involving the interaction. And then you have to figure out what to do with that. And that's where the second bound in step two comes in. But if you had some way of rewriting the Hamiltonian in terms of those emergent fermions, maybe you could do that. Oh, someone asked for a reference for the Sewell paper. I, I can uh, get that in one second. Are there any other questions? Thanks for the great talk. Yeah, thanks. You're welcome. Thanks for, thanks for coming. I'm going to stop sharing. I will. Uh,